Well, I'm going to talk about some of the experiences I've had over the years. I've been keeping fish since I was like 10 years old, and over the years I've kept many, many species of fish, some of them long before the CARES program even was in existence. It's been in existence for about 10 years or so now. Um, let's go to the next slide. And the CARES program, CARES stands for Conservation, Awareness, Recognition, Education, and Support, um, supporting uh, at-risk species in the aquarium hobby. Next. Why do we need CARES? Well, every single continent on Earth has been affected by one or more of these and other uh, I don't know what you want to call them, but over plights, that's a good word, yeah, plights, overfishing, deforestation, pollution, global warming, political unrest, and a bunch of other things. And as a result, lots of species have become endangered or are on the brink of becoming endangered. Next. And we... we we cause all this damage, not really thinking about what kind of effect it's going to have on any of the wildlife in the area. We'll take it, for example, the the greater sage grouse. The sage, this grouse is native to the western United States, and the adults eat sagebrush, as indicated by the name. But the baby a sage grouse does not eat sagebrush. Baby sage gr sage uh, grouse eats it eats uh, mainly ants, and the, in particular, a certain species of ant. And there's a couple of areas out west where developments, housing developments, were made, and grass was planted, and grass is growing. All of everybody's lawns looks all, all nice. And the population of the sage grouse nearby is starting to decline because the young sage grouse are not healthy. It turns out that the grass that was planted in its development is out competing the natural grasses that the ants that the baby sage grouse feed on feed on. So there's no food for the ants. The ant population is dying out, thus the sage grouse population is dying out. Next. So the CARES program was developed in order to try to protect some species of aquarium fishes that are in the hobby. And they've come up with what they call the CARES priority list. It's a list of species that are at risk in the hobby. Next. And they come up with this list based on the input from certain authorities, the main one being the IUCN. Um, there's the CITES, the Gudead Status Report that's published by the American Lab Bearer Association and Dr. John Lyons, Cichlid Room Companion, that's um, Juan Miguel Artigas is us. Next, uh, various books, re input from researchers, collectors, and breeders. Um, not the least of which is Dr. Paul Loisel, and you also have Greg Steves, Mike Helwig, Stephen Tanner, Anton Lamboy, Ken Borman, and many others. Next. So, talk a little bit about the IUCN first. It's the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, when the CARES people are considering a species for inclusion on the priority list, they'll look at the IUCN list first. And if a species is approved on the CARES list that is also in the IUCN red list, the classification that's used by CARES is going to be the same classification that's in the IUCN red list. And you'll see, I'll throw up a CARES list in a few slides, 
every species has a classification as to exactly how endangered they are. Next. And these are the classifications um, from right to left. Right, least concern, nothing to worry about, right? NT, near threatened. Then there are three levels of threatened, um, vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered. And then there are species that are extinct in the wild but still exist in our aquaria. And then there are species that are thought to be totally extinct. Next. All right, and here's a, a, an example of the priority list for the family Nothobranchidae. If you go to the CARES website, there'll be a drop-down list where you can uh, click and choose the priority lists, and then you have a list of families that you can choose from, and you click on the family, and then you'll come up with a whole list of species that are on the priority list, along with their classifications. Um, sometimes when they were assessed and placed on the list, and the authority that placed them on the list. So I chose this, uh, about a third of the Nothobranchia Day list because it has various classifications on it. But the one I wanted to note most was, you'll see there's EN and CEN. If it's just EN, um, that's the classification from IUCN Red List. If there's a C preceding it, then that's one of the, the other CARES authorities that's uh, designated the species at, at that classification level. For example, Epiplatus grami is CARES endangered um, by PVL Paul Loisel. Punyolopanchax jostadi, the blue galeris, CNT, CARES near threatened, also by Paul Loisel. But then you have like Nothobranchius albomarginatus listed as vulnerable and that's listed in the IUCN red list. So you have, there's about maybe 15 families that are listed on the website where you can click and get a whole list of species in that family that are on the priority list. Next. Okay, so now I'll talk about some of my experiences with some of the species I've kept that are on the list. I'll start with the anabantids. Next. First one I'll talk about, Beta alba marginata. Um, this fish I had moderate success with. I kept it in a small tank, five gallon tank, feeding it dry pellets and black worms. Lots of uh, java moss in the tank. pH was probably around six. And I'd see some fry turn up every once in a while. I didn't really try to breed them and still had some moderate success. A lot of times with a lot of fish, if you keep them densely packed with java moss, you'll see fry pop up. Next. What's that? Oh, you dangle a black worm in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much the same story with beta chinoides. Um, didn't do much special with them. They, uh, they just spawned in the tank and fry turned up. You can usually tell, you can see this guy's holding some either eggs or young fry in his mouth. You can see the distended cheeks here. I usually don't try to move them once I notice that they have, have something in their mouth because a lot of times if you move them, it tells them to swallow them. So I leave them in the tank. Next. Now, these fish I've never really been able to get to spawn. These are a uh, Betacachina. They're a bubble nest builder. And never had much luck with them other than keeping them alive for a couple of years and then watching them die in the tank. Next, Beta macrostoma. I picked up some of these at a killifish auction, <laughs> believe it or not. Got a male and three females for 18 bucks. Yep, I was excited too. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to breed these suckers. And at the time, they were going for like 350 bucks a pair on Aquabit. I'm like, I'm going to breed these suckers. I'm going to make a fortune. Every once in a while, every couple of weeks, the male looked like he had eggs in his mouth, but never saw any fry. 
uh, spoke to a few people. They said if you put them in the if you put them in a tank by themselves and then darken the sides so no light can get in, so they don't get spooked and and tempted to swallow the eggs, that'll work. So I I did that. I threw a pair in there, and the male died. <laughs> so I had three females and no male after that. So. And if anybody's interested, there are going to be some in the Pittsburgh Aquarium Society auction on Sunday. Just if anybody's interested in driving out there. Next, Betta simplex. Betta simplex is a species that likes a little bit harder water. Um, these fish, I've had them. They're, it's pretty much the same story as with the macrostoma. I didn't really try to do a whole lot with them, fed them. I noticed that the male was holding a couple of times, but I never got any fry, when I actually did set them up, they would do nothing. So sometimes if you try, nothing happens. Next. Okay, Malpolita cretzeri, the ornate paradise fish. I had some of these about maybe seven or eight years ago, got them up at the NEC auction. They always looked like that. They never looked like that. Spawning, never got them to spawn. And then I just gave them to somebody else I thought would maybe have more time to put into them. So I, I had them for about a year, couldn't do anything with them. Uh, apparently they like really soft acid water. I didn't have really soft acid water, so I moved on. Next. Same thing with these guys. Kept them alive for a while. Prosperminus, Dysonari, Licorice Grammy. Um, they'll stay alive, but to breed them you have to get the pH way down get it down to five or even lower. And I, once, once you get that low, I get, I get timid. I don't like to put the pH down that low. It becomes a lot more, less stable. And you see spikes and pH jumps around from smallest little influences. So had them around for about a couple of years and then they died. Next, ah, Cyprinidae, your barbs, next. Barbus narayani, I'm not really into the barbs and tetras. I saw these, I picked them up because I knew they were cares fish. Kept them for a couple of years, had them in community tank. Never set them up to breed, and then I lost them. Next, Palzerinkos bicolor, the red tail shark. When I had these, I was probably like 12 years old. Uh, way back then, you could get them for like 69 cents in the store. Now you can still get them pretty cheap. Two, not three ninety nine, I think, at that fish place. Um, they are aggressive towards one another. They're still very hard to breed in captivity. A lot of times when they're being bred, uh, they're injected with hormones to induce the spawning. So I don't have any hormones, so I don't keep them. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Well, I personally, hopefully, I have hormones, but <laughs> when he is Dennis and I, Roseline Sharks, I had these for a few years, but then I had an outbreak of ick in the tank and silverfish, tough to cure ick with silverfish, especially with other fish in the tank and when you have no other tanks to put them in because I think I mentioned to some people before, but I, I tend to keep too many fish. I have no empty tanks. So, I had no place to quarantine them, and so they ended up dying. I'll try them again someday. Next, cherry barbs. Again, another fish that you keep when you're a kid, and you never really thought that it would ever be on an endangered species list, but there you have it. They are on the cares list. Um, again, as I said, I'm not really into barbs, so I never really set them up to breed. Kept them for a while, had them for a few years, kept them alive and well, but you know, eventually they get old and die. Next. White Cloud Mountain Minnow, Tenichthys albanubis. Nobody would ever think these fish would be on an endangered species list, but they were until recently believed to be extinct in the wild. They have recently found a population, they're not sure if it's a native population or if it was an introduced population. But they are around, easy to breed, 
you know, if you keep them in a tank with large size gravel, eggs, they'll, they spawn like all the time. Eggs drop into the gravel and you see fry pop up. If you have a pretty well planted tank, you'll have plenty of infusoria for the small fry to feed on. And then they'll, once they get big enough, they'll just start eating what the adults are eating. Very easy. And the same thing goes for the next one, which is the Vietnamese white cloud. Nicthes mycogeme. Pretty much the same thing. And next, the next one's a little trickier. To Nicthes stachyensis, the lemon white cloud. You can see it's got a lot more yellow in it. Um, I picked up a half a dozen of these a couple of years ago. Unfortunately, they all turned out to be males. So I never was able to do anything because I couldn't find any females. They're not a real common fish. Next. Ah, next family, the rainbow fishes. We'll start off with Bedodia Day. Next. Bedodia Gaei, Madagascar rainbow. Fish is pretty easy to keep. Um, rainbow fish fry are very tiny. I was never, I never set them up to really spawn. Um, I thought they'd be around forever, but sadly, I'm down to one male now. I've had them for about four years. Next. And Melanotania Day, next. Chalatherina blairi, Blair's rainbow. Um, these fish I had for a while. Again, as I keep saying, I keep too many fish. I don't set fish up to breed often enough because every time I go to an auction, I see fish and I was like, I've never seen that fish before. I got to have it. And then I have all these fish I've never seen before and I have no place to breed them, raise the fry. So, but it, Easy, most of the rainbow is easy enough to keep, uh, like slightly alkaline water, a little, little hard on the hard side. Next, Centenni rainbow, Chalotherina centeniensis. It's a nice looking fish. These fish I had just emptied the tank for, and I was waiting for a weekend to come up to where I could move them into the tank, and they died in the, like the three days that I had them. I was waiting to move them. I was not happy. Next, zigzag rainbow. There's another, another fish I ended up getting, five or six of them, and they ended up all being the same sex. So I yeah, had them around for about three or four years, and then they passed on. Next, Glossolipus incisus, the red rainbow. Again, same thing. One problem with rainbows is the fry are real tiny. I have had some success with some other species. Uh, next, had some limited success with the Wanamensis, the green or emerald green rainbow or the Lake Wanam rainbow. Um, fry real tiny. If you, if you get a pure strain of these, a lot of, a lot of times rainbow fish you get in stores have been crossed with other species. Uh, if you get a nice pure strain, you get the nice finage on the the anal fin, a nice little sail like that, and a nice emerald green body. Uh, next, Bozeman I've had some success with. Again, fry are tiny. Um, I usually try to start them out with the, the powdered food that you can get in the stores. I'll put them in a tank with a sponge filter, and every once in a while I'll squeeze out the sponge to get some of the microorganisms from the sponge into the water column for the babies to feed on. And once they get big enough, you can start feeding them like microworms or baby brine shrimp. Next, Melanotania ichimensis. Um, another species I ended up, I, had, I only found three of them and they ended up all being females. So I wasn't able to do much with them. Next, turquoise rainbow. Um, Another one I had good success with. Uh, again, same way as I described for the, the Bozeman eye rainbow. Powdered food and infusoria from the sponge and then move them on up with microworms and baby brine shrimp. Next. Lanitania parva, sunset dwarf rainbow. I had these guys looking pretty much just like that in my tanks. And I was going to set them up because they were in a community tank. And as sometimes happens, I ignored duckweed in my tanks. And the duckweed choked out the surface. And I had massive death due to oxygen 
deprivation in the tank, including my parlance. Next. So don't let the uh, don't let the duckweed get out of hand, or salvinia, or anything else that you got growing on the surface. All right, the blue eyes. Brian Cush, where are you? Did you? Didn't you end up getting the cyanodorsalis when you, you did? Three days after I put those in the auction, when you were speaking about that ACLC, they put them on the CARES list. I hope. <laughs> well, I hope that's not true. Those are cool fish. Hopefully, you're breeding them and you got them coming out your ears. But yeah, it's a nice fish. I had them keep. Kept them going for a while, and then I was like, eh, grew them up there just about getting to the breeding size, and I was like, I'm going to clear out some of these fish, and I'm going to start breeding some of the ones that I really want to breed, and the care species, and I decided to get rid of these. And of course, like three days later, they get popped onto the cares list, so I was not happy about that. But the um, guy I got them from, some, probably a lot of you people already know him, uh, Sal Silvestri up in Connecticut. He, he, he was breeding them. He had fry coming out of his ears, just five-gallon tanks full of them. Yeah, just a, I, I was keeping them in just like a tablespoon of sea salt per gallon. Um, well, bra brackish can, the salinity can vary. Um, actually, Sal was keeping them in f pure fresh water, but I know that they're a brackish water tank, so I put a, a little bit of salt in with them. But, you know, s some brackish water, you know, you can, you can have the specific gravity of, like, 1.012, or, you know, salt water is 1.020 to 1.025, you know. Brackish water is sometimes half of that, or any amount of salt can be considered brackish. Next. Another one that likes a little bit of salt in there, in the water. Again, this one, all these, most of these pseudomoogles that I'm going to show you, they've only recently been put on the CARES list, so I've kept them long before they were on the CARES list. This one I had some moderate success with. Um, Again, a little bit of salt in the water, not much. And again, just like the regular rainbow fish, fry are tiny. So try to keep them in a, in a setup with a bunch of java moss or, or najas grass or something that's growing densely in the tank and the fry hide in there and they eat the infusoria that's growing around. And then once they get big enough, you know, when you set them up to spawn, after about three or four weeks, you can just start squirting baby brine shrimp into the tank, and eventually you'll start seeing young fish coming out, eating it. Next. Same thing with Furcatus. I kept those maybe about 10 years ago. No salt in the water with those, though. Those are fresh water. Next. Ivan Safi. Those I had more recently. Uh, again, I didn't try to breed them when I had them. They weren't on the cares list, so I didn't pay a whole lot of attention. They just looked kind of pretty in the tank. Next. Same thing with these guys, the Pasci. Yeah, the Ivan Safi and the Pasci have been pretty popular in the hobby the last couple of years. Shown up on Aquabit a lot. Uh, next. And Sudamugo tenellus. Again, this one I probably had about 15 years ago. Picked them up at an NEC auction. Again, all these fish get to like maybe an inch, maybe an inch and a half for the bigger ones. They're very small fish. The eggs are very tiny and the fry are very tiny when they start out. Next, killifishes. All right, start with Apocalidae. Next. Pachypanchax omelinotis. All the Pachypanchax are Madagascar killies. Um, omelinotis was a particularly easy one to breed. Big eggs, lots of eggs. 
um, if you feed them well with uh, black worms and other live foods and frozen blood worms, you get lots of eggs and lots of fry. Fry are big, easy, easily take uh, baby brine shrimp. Next. Unfortunately, I haven't, didn't have as much luck with uh, Packy Panchak's Patricier uh, because the pair I bought turned out to be two males. So you don't have a whole lot of success that way. I still have one of them, but I haven't found a female for them. Next, Packy Panchak's Saccharamii, again, much like Omelanotis, very easy to breed. The, these... These are some of the bigger killifish. They're stocky bodied and they get to about maybe four inches or so in, in length. Next, Packy Panchak Spark Sorum. This fish I've had for about three years. I got about three eggs out of them. I don't know what the deal is. I'm going to try a few different things, but uh, they're good size, eating pretty well, but I. I think I have males and females, but none of my males look like that. That's the only picture I could find, so I'm not really even sure if that's what it's supposed to look like. But hopefully I'll have some success soon. Next. Nothobranchiidae. Next. Aphiosemian poliacae. Another uh, fish that's uh, great to spawn in a, in a planted tank set up with the java moss or what, what I like to do with uh, some of the aphiosemians and fungio, especially fungio panchax is set them up with a uh, under gravel filter. I don't know if you can even get under gravel filters anymore but I get them at auctions and stuff. Uh, some small gravel on top. Fish will lay their eggs in the, the fungio loop panchax will lay their eggs in the gravel but the aphiosemians will lay them in the gravel and also in mops or plants or whatever you have in there. And the water flow through the gravel keeps the eggs oxygenated so they develop real well. And if you, you know, best success I've had is I would plant water sprite in the gravel. Water sprite would grow and cover the surface and then, you know, a couple of months later you look down and you got like hundreds of fry hiding in the water sprite at the top. Next. Fungiolu Panchex MEAI, uh, not too hard to breed, about six to eight week in dry incubation period. Um, a problem I had with these fish was I, I think I raised like 27 fish and 24 of them were males. So very bad sex ratio with them. Unless you're selling them in pet stop stores, then it's pretty good because they like the males there, right? Next. Blue Galaris, Fungia Lupanchex shows that I, so-called king of the killifish. I've had moderate success with these. Um, if you wet incu water incubate them, incubation time is about three to four weeks. Dry incubation is about six to eight weeks. But I've heard stories that uh, if you breed young pairs of Blue Galaris, the incubation period is short, like three to four weeks and you get a high number of unfer infertile eggs. And as the fish get older, they'll lay more and more eggs and the incubation time on the eggs also goes up. So I don't know if that's true. I'm going to try it. I just picked up a pair a couple weeks ago. So I'm going to try and see if, what kind of results I have with that. But yeah, the fryer, the eggs are big, fryer big, baby brine shrimp from the start, grow fast. Next, Nothobranchius forshi. Nothos are an true annual fishes. You know, they'll live about five, six, seven months maybe. Um, lay their eggs in the mud. Uh, forshi has an incubation period about maybe three months, sometimes four depending on temperature. The fry are just big enough to take baby brine shrimp from the start. Some people will start them with microworms. I prefer baby brine shrimp. I try to start all my fish with baby brine shrimp, actually, and then if I fail, if I fail with the baby brine shrimp, then I'll try to get some smaller foods. Even baby bettas get baby brine shrimp. Uh, next, 
of the Branchius kilmbarrowensis, nice blue and red fish. Um, I got a few of these coming up. Uh, about a another one that's about a three to four three to four month incubation period. Next, all my nothos I keep like a teaspoon of salt per gallon with the water. They like harder water. If if the water's too soft and they tend to get velvet, so good to keep some salt in the water with the nothos. A couple of different color strains of Nothobranchius cortalsi. There's the red strain and there's the so-called yellow strain. Um, I've kept both. Easy fish to keep. Um, six to eight week incubation period generally, sometimes a little longer depending on temperature. But again, baby brine shrimp from the start, no problem. Next, Nothobranchius rubra penis, pretty much the same. Keep all my nothos the same. Next, sometimes I have success, sometimes I don't. Rubra penis, I've raised a couple hundred of those back in the day. Next. Okay, next killifish family, Rivulidae. Next. Sinolevius boitani. I had those fish for about three days and they died. So I'll try to get them back again someday, but I haven't seen them at a reasonable price in recent years. Next. First fish I ever got BAP points for way back when I was a kid. The Madlevius white eye, then it was called Sinolevius white eye. Probably the easiest um, annual killifish to spawn, but again, it was just recently added to the CARES list. Um, when I bred them, I had two trios set up in a 29 gallon tank. That was before I knew you could put killifish in much smaller tanks. So I had them in there with a big drum bowl full of peat and they were always in there. I was feeding them black worms and tubifex worms and mosquito larvae, frozen brine shrimp. And they were just constantly in there. First batch I hatched had about maybe 400 babies <laughs> come out of it. Very easy, baby brine shrimp from the beginning. Next. The Madalibius papiliferous, very similar to the white eye. Um, Again, it's a, it's a white eye is about a two two month to ten week incubation period. Same thing with the papilliferous. Very easy to breed. Next, Ophthalmolebius constantiae. This fish was believed to be extinct way back in the 70s until it was rediscovered. Um, it's kind of a cool looking fish, just with a bunch of black spots on it. Another another one. It's pretty easy to keep. Really, it's a uh, about a two, two to two month to ten week incubation period for the eggs, and again, if you got a couple of, I like to group spawn, especially the annual killifish, because you get a lot more eggs in the peat and a lot better chance of getting a good hatch when you do dry instead of looking at the peat bowl that you just put your peat in with water and you look at it and like, no fry, that's disappointing. <laughs> So, the more eggs you have, the better chance you ha have of not being disappointed. Okay, next. Rivulus Euroflamius. Had these for a couple of years. I never set them up to breed. And uh, as with all Rivulus, they are quite good jumpers, and that is how they met their fate. I left the tank uncovered once. So, haven't seen them again since, so... If I do, I'll get them back and try to breed them. Next. Live bearers, Pisciliidae. Next. Philicthes quadrupunctatus, another recent addition to the CARES list. When I was keeping them, they weren't on the CARES list, and that was only a couple of years ago. I, very easy to breed. You know, uh, quadrupunctatus for the four spots, the fourth spot being the uh, up on the shoulder there, it's kind of dim. Some people think it's the eye, but... It's not, but it, easy, as easy to keep as any platy or sword tail or any of those. Lots of fry. Next, Sophophorus malinche. These I have now. Um, they're not really big enough to have any youngsters, so I'm hoping that soon I will be able to breed them. 
but I'm keeping them in with some Neolamprologus brichardi because they like some hard water and they're getting along pretty well with the brichardi. So, next, Zephophorus milleri, another one. It's another one of those the plain old wild platies. Um, got very little color, so nobody likes to keep them, but that's how they end up on the cares list. But they're easy to keep, easy to breed, pop out like 30, 40 fry every uh, five weeks or so. Next. This fish, the Monterey platy, Zephophorus calcianus. This fish used to be all over ACLC. It would be in every month auction a few years back. Now, nobody has it. And it's believed to be extinct in the wild now. And a lot of people in the ALA are looking for it and they can't find it. They don't have, can't find anybody that's actually still keeping it. So it may actually be totally extinct. I had hundreds of them at one point. Next. Gudeids. Now the family Gudeid, Gudeidae is unique in that there's, I think, 44 described species and like 39 of them were on the CARES list. So most of the Gudeids are on the CARES list. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, Alatoka goslini. One of the big problems with a lot of the Gudeids is they do, do not tolerate heat. A lot of them are mountain fish. They like it. We come from really cool water. And I, I picked these up at the ALA convention about five or six years ago. And that was in late April. And by the beginning of June, my basement got too hot at like 70 degrees. It was too hot for them, and they died. Next. Amica splendens. This is one of the few that are very tolerant of heat. Um, nice looking fish with the yellow on the tail with the black edge there. Good fish for eating hair algae. Uh, the gestation period's about two months to 75 days depending on the temperature. One thing I found with these, I've, I've seen them, typically you'll see them about maybe two, two and a half inches, but I've seen some real monsters at like four and a half, five inches. And females, the thing with females that get that big that I've seen, you don't get any more fry. <laughs> you don't get any more fry from a big female. You just get bigger fry. Gudeids um, provide some nourishment, and the females can provide some nourishment to developing fry inside the body. And small females give you a small fry, still good size for you know live bearing fish, about maybe three eighths of an inch long. But you know, bigger females give you a bigger fry. I've I've had big Amica Splendens shooting out three-quarter inch fry. Still only get like 24 to 30, but you get, you know, they can fend for themselves already pretty easily. Next, blue tail Gadeid, um, Taniobius Tauri. This fish I couldn't keep for nothing for the longest time, and then finally I got some. I don't know if it's the strains I had, the people that were breeding them before me, but I finally got some down at uh, Potomac Valley Aquarium Society auction and finally had success with them. Um, really didn't do anything different with them, and it, you know, the last time I had them, but you can see it's got like a sky blue arc on the tail there, blue tail gadeid. They eat just about anything. They do not eat hair algae like the Amica splendens, but I eat flakes and pellets and easy stuff like that. I like fish like that. <laughs> Next, Chapalixes and Costas, another fish that can get pretty good size. So if I've seen them up to four inches or so. Another one, easy to breed. This was kind of reintroduced to the hobby a few years ago at the ALA convention. They had about maybe 50 or 60 of them that they had in... Uh, Raffles, and I, so when I picked mine up, easy to breed, no problems, eat anything. Next, Chapalixis pardalis. These I had a little bit of trouble with, um, probably because of the tank mates I had them with. When I had Amica Splendens, I had them in like an 80-gallon tank with some 
good-sized cichlids and big rainbows and stuff, and they were actually the king of the tank. I thought the same would be true with these guys. They weren't the king of the tank. <laughs> they got beat up, and before I had a chance to get them out, they were killed. So hopefully I'll see them again someday and be able to pick them up. Next. Crackodon Idax. I actually picked these up at Bucks County Aquarium Society auction a couple years ago. Had limited success, got a few fry out of them, but never really got any overwhelming numbers from them. I think they're a cool fish with the silver body and the black fins. But uh, yeah, the, the male was constantly chasing the female, so you know, next time I get them, I'm going to try to get an excess of females. Next, Crocodon lateralis. Not as aggressive as the Audax. Um, I think it's just as nice. You have to like the cinnamon red body with the black markings on the tails and tail and the uh, dorsal and anal fins. Again, most of these gudeids, uh gestation periods about 60 to 75 days, depend, depending on the temperature. Fry are always, you know, at least three eighths of an inch long, sometimes longer. Next, Iliadon white eye. I've only got giant fry from these fish an inch long. These fish get about five or six inches long and the fry are like an inch long at birth. Very easy to keep. Next. This fish I found is a little more sensitive to water conditions. Neotoka bilineata, sometimes you see it listed as Scyphia bilineata. Um, I do have some of these now that seem to be doing pretty well. So hopefully I'll have some fry in a few months. Who knows, you may even see them at your auction next year. Next. Again, most of the Gudeids are being kept in, in pretty hard water. Nothing, nothing real soft for the Gudeids, they like hard water. Scyphia francese, I got picked up a bag of about 10 young a few months ago. They're just about getting to adult size now. So hopefully I'll have some fry from these pretty soon. But again, they're good day they eat just about anything, anything you offer them. Next, Scyphia lerme. It's one of the least colorful uh, of the Scyphias. Scyphias usually have a little bit more color, but they're pretty much a silver fish. But of course, the silver, the ugly silver fish are the ones that will multiply for you. So I had lots of these at one point. Next, Scyphia multipunctata. Probably my favorite of the Scyphias. You got the, the jagged edge on the dorsal fin. You got all the various markings, which vary greatly from fish to fish. Of course, I've not had any luck breeding them. Been able to keep them alive easily enough, but I have not seen fry. I do still have some, but I haven't looked at them closely. I'm not even sure if I have males and females. So I know I have males. I just don't know if I have any females. Next, Xenophorus captivus, another one that was pretty easy uh, to breed. Had them in a 10-gallon tank with uh, just some Java moss and some some uh, crypts growing in there. Fry showed up. These got pretty big, probably about four inches long. Next, Xenotinia rosolinae. These are another nice fish that I've got, got some of these in with uh, like five inch uh, Guiana caras, cichlids, and nobody bothers them. So, but I haven't seen it. I, I know they've had fry. I'm sure that the fry have gotten eaten because I didn't get them out of the tank, the f females out of the tank soon enough. And whenever I'd go back to the tank, I'd notice that they were about to give birth. I'd go back to the tank the next day to try to get them out. And darn, they already gave birth. Of course, there were no fry in the tank because the cichlids ate them. <laughs> so, next. Xenotoka doadrioi. You may have seen these um, in various auctions recently as Xenotoka Isoni. Isoni has been 
There were three locations of ice, Xenotoka ice and I in the hobby. Um, two of them have been described as their own species, including this one, Xenotoka doadrioi. I've got some young from these coming up. I did bring a pair of them in for the auction. I figured I should bring at least one care species for your auction. So you'll have a pair of those in the auction. But uh, yeah, easy. My, my water out of the tap is about 7 pH and 100 parts per million hardness. And that's what they get, and they've been doing well. Next. And there's Xenotoka the ice and I. A lot of times, the red tail gadade, a lot of times you'll see with better um, red coloring on the tail. And this one's another one that's easy. I'm, I know I've seen this one in your auctions. That's why I didn't bring any. Um, I may, the ones I have, I may have even gotten here. So, But again, easy. Eat anything. Have fry very regularly. Next. See, Natoka Melanosoma. I have just noticed some young in my tank with these guys. Got these about in the spring at the Potomac Valley at auction. Um, they're maybe a half inch, maybe a little bigger when I got them finally large enough to have fry, so hopefully in a few months I'll be able to bring some to some of the auctions. Again, they're in a tank with just a bunch of uh, java moss in there. So, next. So, Ogoneticus kitsuensis. Haven't had much luck with that fish. They seem to be a little more sensitive to water quality. I get a little lax sometimes when my water changes, and they didn't like that, and they passed on. Next, tequila is a lot more tolerant of my husbandry skills. <laughs> um, again, easy one to keep. Kitsuensis, not so much. Next, uh, the grand finale, Cichlidae. Nobody in here keeps cichlids, do they? <laughs> All right, next. Alana Caracandia, it's the blue orchid peacock. These I kind of bred accidentally. I had them in a tank, and I was tearing down the tank and moving them to a bigger tank, and while the females were in my little transfer container, they spit fry. So I was like, cool. So I raised those suckers up and got my BAP points and spread them around ACLC and hopefully some people are still working with them. I don't have them anymore, but they're pretty easy to keep. Fed them pretty much just flakes and uh, uh, spirulina pellets, stuff like that. Next. Coptodon bythobates. Unfortunately, when I got them, couldn't find a good picture of them. That's the best picture I could find, the only picture I could find. Um, Coptodon is formerly known as tilapia. Um, I got a pair of these, and the female died shortly after I got them home. The male looks nice, though. In a 30-gallon tank with some rainbow fish. Next, Coptodon snyder eye. Got some of these at a North Jersey auction, thanks to Tom Galuli. And I have a pair left. They've been spawning, but I've been traveling too much. I haven't been able to save any of the fry. I've been trying to let them raise them themselves. They get them up to free swimming, and then they kind of disappear. So at some point, I guess, the next time they spawn, maybe I'll try to separate them out and raise some of the fry. But they're nice, easy to keep fish. Next. The Harris Murnay. Um, everybody tells me that they're giving me males, and I look at the fish. I, I bought some of these at an auction, maybe, uh, maybe May or June, and um, like they all look like they're females to me. And I talk to the people that bring them in, or other people that have them, and I say I need a male, and then they bring me a fish, and I'm like, that looks like a female to me too. So. I've got all these fish together. I have not noticed any eggs, so I don't think I have males and females. I think I still have, I have a lot more females than I started with, that's all. <laughs> but they're easy to keep. They eat anything. 
Next. Cryptoharus nanoluteus. Cool little yellow, I hesitate to say convict, but yeah, they're in the convict group. They're really nice looking fish. Very good parents. I had them in a community tank and they raised the fry up to about um, maybe three eighths of an inch before I took the fry out. So can't complain about that. And the fish doing my work for me. So next. These fish I just recently got. I don't know if I have males and females yet. They're still too young to tell, but they eat anything. They're active. They come out. Like my water, or seem to like it anyway. Hopefully I'll have some fry from them in a couple of months. Next. Enigmatic chromis lucanus eye. I think I, I did the same mistake with these as I did with another species that will be coming up. And that is, I put small fish into a tank that was way too big for them. Um, when I got them, they are about maybe an inch long. And I put them in a 75-gallon tank with some other fish. And I just think they had trouble finding food in such a big tank. So I have to keep them in the smaller tank until they get some size on them next time I get them. Next, Aphlochromus species ruby. Another one um, that I bred accidentally, was moving them from their tanks and the females spit the fry into the container. So, but again, easy, th you know, these mouth brooders, you see, f see them holding eggs all the time in the tank. You know, see females hiding under rocks all the time, chances are she's holding eggs in her mouth. Next, Lanachromus chipoke. Um, one of my favorite fish, even though it looks a lot like our Addis's, which is actually one of my favorite cichlids. Um, I didn't have a whole lot of success with these, though. I would think th I had these right before, I got them a few months before we decided to move, and then I got rid of all my fish I had when we moved from, from New I used to live up in upstate New York before I moved to Pennsylvania. So got rid of them before I had a chance to really work with them. But, you know, they were alive and well, and seem to be thriving. Next. Paratropolis menorambo, pinstripe dumba. Again, same mistake. I got small fish. Everybody said keep them in a big tank. So when I got the small fish, I put them in the big tank, and I don't think they found enough food when I was offering it to them. Next. Elvicochromus sacramonis. These fish are very good jumpers. That's how I lost them, unfortunately, before I even had them very long. Next. And this is the other species that uh, I put in tank that was too big for them. They seem to be doing okay, but just after a while, they started to get more th thinner and thinner, and I just think they weren't getting enough food. Next. Prognathochromus perrieri. This is uh, extinct in the wild from Lake Malawi. Picked these up at the NEC convention a few years ago. Unfortunately, all the fish that I picked up turned out to be females. So that didn't work too well. Next. So if you want to see what all the fish are that are on the CARES priority list, you can uh, go to the new CARES website, which is caresforfish.org, and there's all kinds of information. And this is actually the first program I've given as an official care speaker. So you guys get the thrill of that. Keystone Clash coming up September 22nd to 24th. Four speakers, got Andreas Tonka coming over from Germany, Chris Biggs coming down from Canada, Lawrence Kent, and your own Mark De Niro. I think there are, yeah, there are nine programs all together. Uh, 34 class all species show, 14 of the classes are the CCY's Clash of the Cichlids, which is an ACA san sanctioned show. There's a total of 115 possible awards. Um, and also, what has also just recently been added is, uh, let's see if I can get this right, I think Best of, sh best of Show is getting a $200 gift card to Reef to Rift. Uh, Reef to Rift 
in addition to being one of your sponsors, they are sponsoring the entire show. And they're, so they're providing all the awards for the show. And in addition to our regular awards, uh, Best of Show is getting a $200 gift certificate to Reef to Riff. Reserve of Show is getting a $100 gift certificate. Um, all the other special awards, I think, are getting $50 gift certificates. So that's in addition to the regular awards. So hopefully, you know, we also have the uh, Keystone Challenge. If you guys think you can uh, beat one of the host clubs, come on out with your fish. The club that has the most show points for, from the show will get, I think the club award is $300, and the individual award, the individual with the most show points, gets 150 but that's uh, September 22nd to 24th. Hopefully we'll see you there.